Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. Uh, to my right is Dr. Rekha Gustafson, who uh, is a Vice President of the Provincial Health Services Authority and is here as the Deputy Provincial Health Officer today. And uh, this is our COVID-19 briefing for Thursday, August 20th. We're honored to be here on the territories of the Musqueam, of the Squamish, of the Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, August 21st, we'll be uh, providing a written briefing, uh, Dr. Gustafson and I, at approximately 3 o'clock with case counts and other relevant information. On Monday, uh, from Victoria, uh, I'll, be, I'll be joined by Dr. Bonnie Henry, and we'll be providing a briefing, uh, a briefing in person on that day. Uh, and with that, it's my honour uh, to introduce Dr. Rekha Gustafson. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, I'm Rekha Gustafson, Deputy Provincial Health Officer, and I'm uh, going to give the public health briefing today. And thank you. So today we are reporting 80 new cases in British Columbia of COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, bringing the total since the beginning of the pandemic to 4,825 COVID-19 infections. By health authority, 1,526 are in Vancouver Coastal Health, 2,533 are in Fraser Health, 150 are in Vancouver Island Health Authority, 411 were in, in the interior, and 121 were in Northern Health. 75 infections were among people who came from outside of Canada. Currently, we have 780 active cases, of whom 11 are hospitalized and 4 are in critical care. 2,574 people are at this time under active public health monitoring. We are sad to report two new deaths in the Fraser Health Authority, bringing the total to 200 deaths in British Columbia to, due to COVID-19. Our sincere condolences to all those who have lost friends and loved ones during the COVID pandemic, and in particular to those who lost loved ones recently. At this time, 3,845 people are fully rec recovered from their COVID-19 infection. There are no new healthcare outbreaks reported today. There are, however, nine active outbreaks being monitored by the health authorities in our healthcare system. Eight of those are in long-term care facilities or in assisted living, and one is in acute care. Among community outbreaks, there has been one new community outbreak with nine confirmed cases of COVID-19 at Loblaws reported in the Fraser Health Authority. Fraser Health Public Health teams are on-site ma managing this cluster. In Haida Gwaii, there, was a, uh, there is an outbreak that's being actively monitored, and the update on that outbreak is that everyone in that cluster is at this time considered fully recovered. Public health will continue to monitor for potential new infections um, until the outbreak is declared over. Health authorities continue 
to issue community exposure alerts for a number of locations and flights coming into and out of BC. Please do check these websites regularly to make sure that uh, you are up to date on any potential exposures. So what do today's numbers tell us? We do continue to see new infections in British Columbia. The number at this time is relatively stable, but we are continuing to see them. The number of people in hospital and intensive care units remain low. We are seeing a small increase in, the, in infections in the 40 to 60 year age group. We are carefully monitoring this trend because we know that the risk of severe illness goes up with age. And the two new deaths in long-term care facility, of course, re reflect the vulnerability of this population to severe disease from COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic has really been hard for many of us. We have seen um, in, this pop in this year's population health survey um, from British Columbians that they are, they are mentally health and sometimes their economic well-being is really being affected by uh, the COVID pandemic. We have had to change many things and learn new ways to safely live our lives. Yet British Columbians have shown incredible resilience and caring and fortitude in this pandemic. Um, in addition to COVID-19, in recent weeks, parts of the province have also had to manage forest fires. And COVID-19 brings an, an, an added complexity to that, especially if you have to self-isolate, especially if you are at risk for severe disease. I can only imagine how hard that must be. And I, I do want to assure you that public health is working with emergency management to support you at these difficult times. I would like to talk a little bit about gatherings. Um, we are actually fortunate in British Columbia to have some of the best public health experts in the world, working in our health authorities and in our universities. And not only are they doing their own research, they're constantly reviewing research and data from both around the world, but also our local experience to bring that information to bear on the decisions that we make coming up. You may not know them, you may not see them regularly, but they are tirelessly working to keep all of us safe. And one of the things that they're finding is that regardless of where we may be in our province and what we may be doing, we have seen that indoor gatherings that are encouraging very close proximity tend to be an important source of transmission. The two notable things about these gatherings are crowding and in some cases alcohol. These are often small outdoor gatherings that are different from controlled settings such as an office or a classroom where you know who is in the room and you can more easily take precautions. So that is why we're asking you to keep your group small, to spend time with people you know, and to always stay at home when you are sick. By doing this, you are supporting not only the public health teams, but your family, your friends, and your community to stay safe. While we still have much to learn about COVID-19, we do know that by continually monitoring for clusters, quickly managing new cases, and containing the spread, we can protect those most vulnerable and keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. Please do understand the risk and be an influencer. Support your friends and family to do the right thing. And we all recognize that this COVID-19 hasn't been easy, but we can be assured that by continuing to work together, we will get through this. And I'd like to thank you again for all you are doing. Thank you. And I'd like to hand it back to Minister Dix. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gustafson. Um, uh, and first of all, I'd like to say on behalf of the government, of the Premier, uh, to express our uh, condolences to the families and the friends and the communities and the caregivers of the two people who've passed away in the last 24 hours from COVID-19 in care in Fraser Health. We know uh, what a difficult uh, and challenging time this is, especially uh, in families that are dealing with the loss of a loved one and the grief that that entails. And I want to express our condolences to them and to the others who have passed away from COVID-19. That number now is 200. And while round numbers um, don't have uh, significance in and of themselves, they remind us, I think, of the extent of the loss. Uh, we're also reminded during this time of pandemic, for example, in, uh, in May and in June, 
of the 346 people lost to the other public health emergency we're dealing with in BC, the overdose crisis. And to all of those who have lost loved ones for all kinds of other reasons in BC. Uh, yesterday, a dear, very dear friend of ours, of our congregation, our minister, and our friend Blake Field passed away. Uh, as a result of cancer and I, I'd say that in the last 24 hours our church community in this case has been dealing with this loss. Uh, Reverend Blake was an extraordinary minister and an extraordinary man and I think uh, what he probably remind us of uh, here today are things that are good public health messages that we have to in difficult times uh, seek ways to find joy and to find happiness and to be together uh, either virtually or with our loved ones in ways that keep us safe. He'd probably tell us to lift, lift ourselves up when we fall and to avoid at all costs blame. And we need to do this because we're going to be dealing with this pandemic for a long time. He'd probably tell us to protect and to empower the most vulnerable. And that has been at the core of what we've been trying to do with everything we've done in, uh, in response to this public health emergency. And he'd probably tell us we need to support each other in difficult times, and surely we do. Because these are challenging times and difficult times. Uh, we, like all of uh, those who have lost friends and family in these times, we understand how difficult it is. And just like Blake Field, who was a wonderful guy, I want to say on behalf of all those people who are struggling in these times, that we hear you and we uh, grieve with you. Uh, I think that uh, extraordinarily as well, I wanted to acknowledge the work of public health uh, in this period. And that work is obvious to all of us, but it's, obviously, it's obvious also in the statistics that we see every day. We've seen, as happens in, er in periods when there are a rise in cases or when there's a rise in public anxiety, an increase in calls to our 811 service. And the work done by everyone at 811 is truly extraordinary. Just to consider, in the month of July, 70,668 uh, phone calls answered. That's twice as many as in an average July. And yesterday, uh, 2,728 phone calls answered. And of course, we increase in resources as in response to uh, public demand. You'll know that on March 20, 25th, 5,070 calls were answered uh, by our, our team at 811. And at the, at the lowest point in the pandemic in terms of calls, that number was 1,700. The number yesterday, as I said, was 2,728. We're also, of course, increasing in uh, the amount of testing we're doing. And we've significantly seen that in the last uh, in the last 24 hours as we've increased hours, uh, op operating hours at five centers in the Fraser Health Authority, that new temporary testing and assessment centers will be open in Surrey and Fraser Northwest in, in the coming weeks. And more staff is being deployed to Burnaby, to Langley, and to Abbotsford. In Vancouver Coastal Health, a new assessment center opened yesterday with an additional center coming online in North Vancouver soon. Vancouver Coastal Health has also expanded hours of service in Richmond with work underway to open existing locations for seven days a week. Uh, the overall turnaround times in laboratory remains constant. Uh, in uh, in uh, Fraser Health, it's about 26 hours. In Vancouver Coastal Health, 24 hours. In Vancouver Island Health, the turnaround time is 16 hours. So yesterday, for example, there were 4,207 uh, test results. And as you can tell, with 80, um, with 80 positive tests, that means a positive rate of around 1.8, 1.9%. We also have, as Dr. Gustafson said, 2,574 people who are effectively under public health surveillance, who are uh, self-isolating. Uh, and that is an extraordinary engagement by public health staff. The rapid response that public health does uh, in outbreaks, uh, such as the one at the Loblaws warehouse that Dr. Gustafson uh, just referred to, but also, and importantly, in long-term care. In short, uh, public health is doing what they do which is to help people uh, to alleviate suffering and to prevent um, the expansion of the pandemic and to save lives. And what they're doing here on this typical day in August reflects how extraordinary that work is. I want to just um, briefly, and I'm sorry I'm taking uh, more time than usual, I just have a couple of reports that we typically give on Thursday. 
On May the 7th, we of course released uh, our commitment to surgical renewal. On May 18th, we resumed uh, non urgent scheduled surgeries. Between uh, uh, May 18th and August the 10th, we completed 77,864 surgeries, 59,446 of which were scheduled surgeries, and 18,418 were unscheduled or emergency surgeries. That's 14,670 in interior health, 21,863 in Fraser health, 17,681 in Vancouver Coastal Health, 15,894 in Vancouver Island Health, 4,500 in Northern Health, and 3,256 in the Provincial Health Services Authority. Last week we reported 4,718 surgeries were completed from August 3rd to the 9th. Health authorities have verified their data and the total number of surgeries completed for the, per the period is actually uh, is upgraded to 4,886. This period included the BC Day. Uh, BC Day long weekend uh, or BC Day when scheduled surgeries were not performed. This week we completed 6,132 surgeries, significantly above last year's period. And as you know, vacation management is reducing the summer slowdown due to planned vacation by 52%. Obviously, some vacation time is now being taken, but much less than a typical year. I'm also pleased to report that mechanical issues with one of Northern Health's operating rooms were fixed August 14th. When we po po postponed surgeries, we made a commi commitment to patients that you are not forgotten. From ophthalmology to orthopedics to cardiac to thoracic patients, you have not been forgotten. The number of surgeries re we report on each week includes surgeries from all of these areas. As we continue our commitment to renewal, we'll be profiling how we'll improve efficiencies and increase surgical cases in several of these specific surgical areas Areas, beginning with ophthalmology. There are nearly 23,000 cataract cases waiting for surgeries, about a quarter of our wait list. I again want to express my appreciation to everyone who's involved in delivering our commitment uh, to surgical renewal and our commitment to patients. Uh, with respect to long-term care, I just uh, want to bring an update. Obviously, all visitor safety plans have been completed and all long-term care homes, with the exception of those with active outbreaks, uh, are, are seeing visitors at this time. Uh, as you know, practice guidelines were set in place on June 30th, and each long-term care or assisted living home has produced and prepared its visit visitation plan. I wanted to say that resources being provided are being provided to assist facilities in adapting to these new guidelines and this will be uh, in the coming period up to four FDEs or people per facility, full-time equivalent jobs per facility depending on size. This is up from three previously reported as there was room in the funding envelope to provide additional FTE per site to offset administration costs. Um, as you know, uh, ministry staff are actively uh, reviewing the social and family visitation policy now, as we promised to do. It's, it's been in place now for a number of weeks, and we will, be pr we will take, uh, obviously, a thorough and thoughtful approach to this review. Uh, in closing, I wanted to say that uh, it's been a long time. Uh, next week, it'll be seven months since we started providing these briefings. It's been a long time since we started our COVID-19 response, which was in January when the team set up that involves Dr. Gustafson and her team, but also led by Dr. Henry and our Deputy Minister Steve Brown has been in place. It's a long time to stay 100% all in. Uh, twice during the, pa the past many months, I've drawn upon the words of Dr. Michael Ryan of the World Health Organization. Early on, he said something I've drawn upon when times were harder in our BC fight. He said that in a pandemic, we have choices. He said we can give up or we can fight. It's that simple and it's that hard. We can give up or we can fight. So we look at our recent COVID case numbers and we ask ourselves, do we still fight? And I think we do. On Wednesday, we announced uh, uh, that as on August 25th, the state-of-the-art PET CT scanner will start helping patients at the Kelowna BC Cancer Centre. For the first time outside of Vancouver, people will be able to receive this care. And that was just on Wednesday. These past six months and beyond, each day, people across BC, exceptionally gifted people who work in healthcare, who work for healthcare, researchers, healthcare workers, and healthcare professionals at BC Cancer, and in all our specialized agencies and the health authorities fight. They fight to do better. So do their patients, and so do their patients' families. They fight to do better, pandemic or not. Each day they fight. 
People in healthcare fight alongside the patients who are counting on them. Do we continue to fight in our BC pandemic response? It's my job to say yes. It's my experience that we can and we do, and it's my belief that we will. And to do that, we need to make a commitment to ourselves to make sure we're renewing our spirit, to make sure we've restore, we're restoring our energy, to make sure we're up to the fight. We take a long view in a pandemic, but let's, this weekend, let's take a shorter view, one that sees us step away from the coverage of COVID to safely living our lives despite it. The activities we do, the outings we can take, and the connections we can safely make that remind us of what we have to do in our lives, of who we have in our lives, and how we are renewed and restored when we strengthen these connections. Everybody has their own comfort zone. Within it this weekend, let's head to a park or a beach or the, uh, and, and stay and work and be with those in our bubbles. Walk our neighborhoods and see our, our neighbors at a safe distance across a fence or in their garden. Visit uh, grocery stores where hardworking people are working to keep us safe and have been from the beginning and, and to whom we owe an extraordinary debt. Call or do a video connection with friends or family we've not seen or who, who can't get out to enjoy the things that many of us take for granted. It's always worth doing that. There's always the day that comes in all of our lives when we wish we had done that with someone we had spoken to. Run an errand for someone. We know what skills to use to do all of these things safely. Uh, Dr. Henry and I uh, will see you on Monday. Uh, it's been an honor to stand with Dr. Gustafson this week, who is an extraordinary professional, representing many more extraordinary professionals and healthcare workers. Next week, we start a brand new week. But this weekend, let's take time for ourselves and those we care about. Let's take care. It's been a long time, and we need each other to be at our best. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons 80 nouveaux cas qui ont testé positif pour COVID-19, pour un total de 4825 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer deux nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 dans la région de santé de Fraser, pour un total de 200 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances profondes à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches durant cette pandémie. Uh, chaque régie de santé de la Colombie-Britannique compte des patients atteints de, de COVID-19. 1526 se trouvent à Vancouver Coastal, 2533 à Fraser, 159 sur l'île de Vancouver, 411 dans l'intérieur de la province uh, et 121 au nord. Il y a aussi 50, uh, 75 cas de personnes qui vivent en dehors du Canada. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 11 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 4 en soins int intensifs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Gustafson and I are happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. And before we take questions, a reminder to the media to please press star 1 to line up for questions. We will be taking one question and one follow-up this afternoon. And please do not mute your phones. You will not be heard until I call your name. We begin today with Keith Baldry, Global News. Keith, go ahead, please. I thank you for this. Uh, it, regarding your, your t um, talking about 811 calls, uh, there's been a serious surge in those in the number of those calls. If we keep on our average this month, August will see more calls than any month uh, dating back till March. I'm just wondering, is that an indication that the public feels a lot of anxiety right now, that more people than, than since the beginning of the pandemic are dialing the service that leads to testing? Well, it doesn't just uh, lead to testing, although you're quite right. That's one of the questions it does. Just to put it in context, uh, the total calls answered in, in March was 41,880, but on the highest day in March, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we answered 5,070 calls, or 811 answered 5,070 calls. On other days, for example, March 26th, that number was 4,902. And that has gone up and down, reflecting a little bit the ups and downs of the pandemic. Yes, um, there's no question that we've received more uh, and answered more calls recently. As I say, yesterday that number was 
2,728, which is similar, for example, to July 27th when it was 2,668 at that time. Where there had been lots of expansion of interest and calls from the Interior Health Authority. So the number we received yesterday is relatively high compared to the average and certainly compared to before the pandemic, but it's uh, less than some days in July as well. Um, clearly, uh, we've tested more people in the last 24 hours, I think over 4,000, which may be the largest number we've tested, and the 811 services uh, is expanding. I wouldn't say that the number of calls um, is anything like uh, at the height of the pandemic in March, but it's, it reflects um, the fact that public health is there to support people. Uh, the 811 call and, the, and the, especially the team of nurses that work at 811 do uh, have done an exceptional job from the beginning of the pandemic and, uh, and uh, will be continue to be there for people, just as all the other people who both uh, uh, perform the tests uh, uh, at testing sites across the province, but also the teams at the BCCDTC and those associated with them who, who um, uh, evaluate the tests and provide the results. It is an extraordinary team, and the increase in 811 calls is a reflection of uh, our continuing determination to provide care and service and prevention and advice and support uh, throughout the pandemic. Hello, Keith. Yes, the number of people in isolation, um, more than 2,500, is more than doubled in a little more than a week. Uh, I know the number of the case numbers, of course, are higher than they have been, but uh, is this an example, and I think you mentioned this in the opening remarks, of contact tracing really um, being effective here? Yes, so one of the one of the reasons that the number of people who would be in isolation would increase is if a single individual who was infected uh, spent some time in gatherings. And we have been talking about gatherings, so the, the number of people um, in isolation reflects the type of places where the exposure has occurred and the number of people that have been identified. And so it really is a, it's, it's a reflection of how the types of exposures there are and the, and the intensity of contact tracing that's happening by the public health teams. Thank you. The next question goes to Laura Brahum, CFAX 1070. Laura? Hi, so you mentioned that uh, the new cases today are in pe largely people in the ages of 40 to 60. Um, so previously you've mentioned that uh, cases in young people were uh, happened largely at parties or gatherings. How, is there a trend uh, in the new cases today, or how are these people affected, infected? So just to clarify, actually the majority of new infections do continue to occur in the young adult population. Um, what my, my remarks were about the fact that we're seeing a small increase in a slightly older population and that that's an important thing for us to monitor because the risk of severe illness goes up with age with COVID-19. So at this point that increase is really quite small, but I, uh, my comments were really relating to the fact that that's a trend that we monitor on a regular basis because one of our goals is to protect who are those who are most vulnerable to severe illness. Do you have a follow-up, Laura? No, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Srishti Gangdev, CKNW. Srishti, go ahead, please. Hi, thanks for this. I'm just wondering, um, in Alberta, Dr. Dina Hinshaw has um, tweeted out that everyone who's going back to school, so that includes teachers and school staff, have been invited or encouraged to get tested um, before school starts. I'm wondering, in BC, I know we have stayed away from testing asymptomatic people, except in some cases, like I believe uh, at Mission Institution, there was testing of everyone or not. Is that an option that BC will be looking at for schools? It's not an option that the science tell us, tells us we should take. Uh, we have actually, um, we, we look at the evidence very thoroughly and make decisions based on what is likely to make a difference. One of the things we know about testing people who do not have symptoms is that the yield or the positivity rate is extremely low and because the sensitivity and specificity of the test, 
and that tells you how many of the true positives and true negatives you pick up really declines in in um, in uh, testing that is associated that is um, in people who don't have symptoms so basically what you find is that neither a positive test nor a negative test tells you a great deal in that situation so no we would not recommend that as one of the uh, ways that we want to uh, make sure that people stay safe and are safe um, and and so that is not something I'm anticipating in British Columbia follow-up Srishti no thank you thank you and the next question is from Sarah Reed CTV Sarah go ahead please hi thank you um, I was just wondering what thoughts are on um, BC Ferries making masks now mandatory um, instead of having that as a recommended uh, suggestion for travelers. So we know that um, that masks, albeit they are the lower uh, lower on the hierarchy of um, of interventions, are often a very visible sign that that people have uh, people and organizations uh, choose to implement. And so, from in the context of of uh, uh, situations where you are interacting with individuals who are uh, whom you don't know and who who with whom you may not be able to keep. Uh, uh, um, a, a significant distance, um, that the additional layer of protection that uh, masks provide can be helpful. Uh, with respect to making it mandatory or recommended, that's often the decision of the organization that, that puts that policy in place. Follow up? Yeah, um, just with the, the mention of the number of calls and the uh, turnover time for test results, um, we're hearing that Island Health is facing a lot of technical problems with their phone lines, um, so it's actually preventing people from being able to make an appointment to go get tested. What is your message to the people who want or need to get tested to see fa uh, vulnerable family members but, but can't right now because of this issue? Uh, I think it's being resolved. So my message is that we resolve these problems uh, as we go forward. The relative turnaround of testing uh, uh, results on, the, on island health and tests take place is relatively low. And of course, the positivity rate is um, is relative um, basically to anywhere else in the world. Uh, uh, minute in island health right now, just to put it in context, there are um, uh, there are. Uh, uh, nine active cases on the all of Vancouver Island at present, and obviously, and you'll see because you're following the dashboard uh, every day that the relative number of people who test positive in Vancouver Island is very small. And I'm very proud of our teams there. But I, I want to emphasize this point about Island Health, and it's why uh, people sometimes ask, "Well, why would you continue to have policies in place to protect people that are similar to other jurisdictions?" This is partly because we should remember that different communities have different levels levels of vulnerability. And while we haven't seen outbreaks of large numbers in, uh, on uh, Vancouver Island, in fact, the rates of, of um, the, the rate of positive tests is lower than any, any of the other health authorities in British Columbia, there are many communities because of a relatively high elder uh, population and therefore a high uh, population of people with chronic diseases, there is ultimately more vulnerability on Vancouver Island. That's why we continue to have that policy in place. The problems with respect to calling, uh, I think, are being resolved, either have been resolved or will be resolved shortly. And so that problem will be resolved and we apologize for any, uh, uh, for the inconvenience and concern that that caused. Thank you. The next question you. comes from Yuji Zhang, Omni News. Hi, thanks for taking my question. So the province has uh, announced the hiring of 500 additional people to help with contact tracing. So um, do you have some more details to provide at this moment, such as the recruiting timeline, and if the actual workforce will help work on some new contact tracing technologies? So I can, I can follow. Uh, yes, we've received, um, and um, forgive me, I don't have in front of me uh, the email for people who may be interested in, uh, in these positions, but uh, in front of me, but it's uh, available. And if you go to uh, um, the BC government website or the BC CDC website, you'll be able to easily find that to express an interest in these positions. We've had hundreds of people respond um, to uh, those positions to be contact, uh, to work in contact tracing in this pandemic. I want to see two reasons why it's important. 
important one, we have a significant group of people obviously engaging in contact tracing now. You can see this based on uh, what Dr. Gustafson has reported. What we want to do is increase our capacity. So should the need for more com contact tracing increase in the fall, we are able to respond to that with staff that is there. Should that not happen, then this the, the hiring of these 500 contact tracers will allow the rest of our public health professionals to go back to their regular duties in addition to things such as contact tracing uh, in support of public health across BC. So uh, the response uh, so far has been excellent. We're in the process of, uh, of, uh, of uh, and will be for September of hiring uh, those contact tracers and I'll be happy to uh, report on, on that progress in the, coming, uh, in the coming weeks leading into September. Do you have a follow-up, Yes. So um, uh, I would like to know if uh, if we we see like a more severe research research of the COVID cases, um, how would we, uh, are we considering about introducing some new technologies to improve and enhance our current system of contact tracing, especially to trace those hard to trace uh, co community outbreaks. Um. Uh, yes, I think the short answer is, is yes, that we are, and uh, uh, working with the federal government and working with other provincial governments. The federal government has developed a, an app which is currently being worked on with uh, the government of Ontario, which they worked on to develop the app, and we hope to add that to our efforts here in BC. But, uh, and I, I'm going to invite Dr. Gustafson, who knows about 7,500,000 times better than me this subject, just to say that we believe in BC. And if you can imagine if uh, you were to test positive for COVID-19, to have an experienced person talk to you directly as a person yields better results. It's why we believe in the contact tracing by people, why it's been so effective, why the contact tracing we did, especially in February, limited the growth in that period of COVID-19 in BC. It's extraordinary work that's done and it's uh, the bread and butter work of public health. And I'm gonna leave it to Dr. Gustafson to talk about it a little more. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, we we are exploring technologies and, and information systems that can enhance the work. But as Mi Minister Dix has just said, contact tracing is actually a clinical practice. It's actually clinical care that you're providing to someone who's either has COVID-19 and is worried about their loved ones or somebody who may have been exposed to COVID-19. So cont the essence of the work is actually care. It's, um, it's, it's providing care for people uh, Again, who may be cases and contacts, and that's why hiring hiring people and training people and make sure that they can provide accurate and and skilled um, advice to people who are in that situation is such an important intervention. Contact tracing is actually quite a skilled clinical uh, practice, um, and we have a lot of skilled individuals who are doing it. And expanding that capacity is really what we need to do to make sure that people who have COVID-19 and are worried about their loved ones or people who may may be told that um, they've been exposed to COVID-19 and have really important questions, get those questions answered. Thank you. The next question comes from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Minister Dix and uh, Dr. Gustafson. Thank you for taking my question. We have been getting some complaints say that um, they want to get tested, they're told to get tested, and then when they go line up, they can't really find anywhere where they don't have to wait a long time in order to get access. And I know that you mentioned earlier that the ramping up of, of tests, but we've been told that up to 8,000 tests a day could be done daily, but the numbers are much are lower than that. If you could elaborate on that. Well, I, I think if you look at the last... Um at the last number of days and we give we're not uh, there's no secrets about any of this uh, the number of people we test is uh, on the bccdc dashboard of which dr gustafson is justifiably proud because of the information it provides we provide that information every day and what you're seeing is uh, exactly that a response uh, to public demand for more testing so i think i, I believe the number today and uh, this will be confirmed by the dashboard at five o'clock is around uh, four thousand two hundred uh, uh, 
tests that were performed yesterday, of which we had 80 positive tests, as Dr. Gustafson has reported, and that's an increase in the demand for testing that we saw before that. And, and so what we're doing um, is responding to that. We do have the capacity for 8,000 tests and respond to that by extending hours, by adding more staff, in some cases adding new lanes, in some cases opening new sites to respond to that. Uh, if you're doing, if the, if the public demand is 1,800 tests a day, you don't want to have people there prepared to do 5,000. You want those things to work in concert, and that's what's happening. The, the 8,000 capacity, therefore, is twofold. You need uh, people to essentially take the test, but you also need, uh, uh, you need to process the tests and get the results. And so uh, our capacity to do that is around 8,000 and can rise to that right now. And our goal in the fall and cold and flu season is to increase that up, uh, up to 20,000 so that we can provide even more rapid response. It may be once we increase our capacity to 20,000 that we don't need to perform anything like that level of tests. But just like we responded in advance in March and prepared um, based on what we knew at that time, prepared our hospitals to be prepared for COVID-19, we're preparing now in a myriad different ways for the situation in the fall. And this is one of the ways that we're doing it. Do you have a follow-up, Marcello? Um, yes, this is actually for Dr. Gustafson. I'm getting lots of emails from people that are still concerned about just how airborne this virus is and that they are worried that there's a lot of research out there suggesting that it can live a lot longer in the air than it does and that we're not really getting the, the full picture about this. Well, I, I, those individuals can really be reassured. Whenever you have a new virus, there are a lot of studies that are, are done on what can happen. But what really matters to us is what does happen. And we are over 20 million infections around the world and the behavior of this virus is now known. And we know that the way it's behaving is that it's transmitted in, in situations with close proximity with others who are, um, who are infected. And that is not the feature of an airborne virus or not a feature of a virus that is transmitted efficiently when airborne. These are the features of, of, of viruses that are transmitted through close proximity through what we call droplet spread. The other thing we know is that if there was a substantial contribution of airborne transmission to COVID-19, then the things we, we are doing that are actually stopping transmission wouldn't be working. So basically what we know is that there are a lot of studies out there that explore what's possible. What matters to us is what's probable and what's actually happening. And this virus has told us how it's behaving and the way it's behaving is not airborne spread. Thank you. And the next question comes from Nick Johansson, Castanet News. Nick, go ahead, please. Hi there. I'm not sure who this question is best suited for, but uh, with the fires here in the Okanagan, uh, what, if any, changes have been made to evacuation protocols uh, in light of the pandemic? So we have been working with Emergency Management BC um, and have created specific uh, guidelines to make sure that the evacuation uh, processes and centers are taking into account the potential for COVID-19 uh, uh, transmission. So to make sure that those activities include the prevention measures that we need to have, such as hand hygiene and, and appropriate separation. So um, so I do want to tell you that, that some time ago, actually, at the beginning of the pandemic, or I would say at the beginning of the summer, the combination of these events were uh, considered and the plans and evacuation plans were adjusted accordingly. Follow up, Nick? Uh, of the people who've been evacuated here in Penticton, uh, do you know if any of them uh, were being uh, required to self-isolate, whether they were COVID positive or because they'd come in contact with a COVID positive person? So such, such a, an event has not been reported to me. So my understanding is that, that time, at, at this time, there are no individuals in that situation reported. However, if that's, uh, that changes, we certainly will update you. The next question comes from Mary Griffin, Czech News. Oh, hi. Thanks very much. Um, it's just a question um, about some medical clinics that are offering um, COVID testing for asymptomatic um, clients that come in. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on those. 
So in British Columbia, uh, after careful review of the evidence, we do not recommend testing of people who do not have symptoms of COVID-19. The test itself does not perform well in that situation, and the results are generally not going to change what you do or should uh, you, what you do in terms of management. We uh, so asymptomatic testing is or t testing of asymptomatic individuals is not something that we recommend in British Columbia as an effective way of controlling um, the, the uh, transmission of this disease. Uh, in exceptional circumstances, it, when a medical health officer is, is, is uh, managing an, an outbreak, they may consider that as a strategy, but it's certainly not recommended in general. Do you have a follow-up? Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering when um, Minister Dix was talking about testing, and um, I think I missed it, he said... Uh, that the positivity rate was 1.8 to 1.9 percent. Is that uh, is that number unusual? And what does that number tell you? Well, it it it's not an unusual number. It basically tells you that the vast majority of people right now who are being tested um, are um, are testing negative for COVID-19. Uh, a very high rate of positivity could mean one of two things. You're testing the right populations or there's an actual increase in testing and uh, sorry, in, in, in increase in infections. It is a way of, of comparing testing capacity with, with, um, with the actual circulation of virus in, in the population. I don't know if Minister Dix has anything to add to that. It's something that we do like to monitor as an indicator of making sure that we're testing the right populations and that we are that our our, dim, our testing is is appropriate for the level of circulation of virus thank you the next question comes from glenn korstrom business in vancouver hi yeah thanks for taking my call the uh, the question is it's uh, sort of a follow-up for minister dix uh, i asked you about a month ago about the hiring at uh, seniors homes care homes so uh, staff aren't expected to manage all these complex visits along with necessary tasks. And you said there was $165 million going into hiring new people. Um, have people been hired? How is that going? Um, the $165 million is a, is a different number, uh, Glenn. The $165.4 million is the uh, cost of the single site proposal, uh, which is obviously an important proposal and one that uh, we're implementing across the province and, uh, uh, and the money goes to people retroactive to the, uh, the, um, the putting in place of the single site proposal. The number, I think, on this it was, was $160 million is a similar number. And uh, that work in some places has happened or is happening and that's the number that will be available. I mean, what we have to do with a visitation policy, one of the reasons we started, uh, as everybody knows, because many people would like to see uh, the visitation uh, policy expanded, as uh, as uh, someone with family members and long-term care, I would want that as uh, I want do want that as well. But I, I think that. Um, the, one of the reasons we started so cautiously is it's going to take some time to put all of these measures in place. So we started cautiously, so it's one designated visitor um, per person in care. But that work uh, is, uh, is ongoing with uh, all of our different uh, care homes in the province. And I think you're going to see um, some significant announcements around recruitment. Because remember, if you're talking about uh, three to four people uh, per um, eligible care home. We're talking about the hiring of uh, people in the thousands. And so uh, some significant work is being done on this and you should expect uh, to hear uh, even more details about uh, the largest bolus of the hiring soon. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, sure. On, on the, the one designated visitor, um, I, I know there's some homes now that are allowing multiple visitors as long as the people are outside and spaced out and and the the resident is either in the doorway or also outside. I'm just thinking when the weather cools and visits are more inside, um, will the one designated visitor be more uh, uh, stringent or a policy that's um, 
more required. Well, I think it's fairly stringent now. Just to say what the practice guidelines are, Glenn, uh, each senior will be allowed a designated visitor who will meet them in a designated visiting area at their care home. The facilities will have dedicated st uh, staff person to screen people as they arrive and to provide guidance so the visitors and residents can safely visit. The visits must be put, booked in advance and visitors must bring and wear a mask. And uh, obviously, as you've noted, resources are being provided to assist facilities in adapting to these guidelines and any changes that would happen in the future. And we're reviewing that now. There are slightly different circumstances in terms of uh, what happens in some care homes outside, but essentially uh, the designated practice, the supported practice, and that laid out by the provincial health officer and the Ministry of Health is uh, that each senior, each senior or uh, person in care will be allowed a designated visitor. There are, of course, exceptions to that uh, under our essential visits policy, which uh, you will know in specific circumstances, in palliative circumstances, people living with disabilities, for example, both in acute care and uh, in long-term care uh, have access to, uh, to advocates since those changes were made in May. But essentially the designated visitor policy has been in place, was announced June 30th, has been in place in most care homes since about the third week in July and is being actively reviewed now. Thank you. The next question comes from Lisa Cordasco, CHLY. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, as, I, as I understand that the BC Lottery Corporation is working with casinos on reopening plans and what would be required, um, and I'm sure you're aware Dr. Henry has said casinos would be the last place uh, she'd open. Uh, given you know our COVID numbers at the moment, how likely is it that casinos will reopen soon? Well, I think I will leave the likelihood to uh, Minister Dix, but one thing, I, if I may say, one of the things to consider is that if you consider what, what we now know about COVID-19 and COVID-19 transmission and who the vulnerable populations are, COVID-19 transmission is highest risk in close settings where people are in close proximity, especially if um, um, they, they um, are interacting quite a bit or are touching many things, and especially if, if some of the behaviors are altered by alcohol. We also know that uh, people, as people get older, uh, their risk of severe disease increases. So uh, from, a, from a disease control perspective, these would be particularly worrisome places to reopen. Uh, I wouldn't expect any change to um, uh, the current uh, rules on casinos anytime soon. Do you have a follow up, Lisa? Uh, thank you, yes. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Doctor, if you can tell us anything about the cases uh, in island health, which um, looking at the dashboard last time and the surveillance report looked like uh, they weren't travel related, but um, community exposure. So can you like expand on what that means? So one of, when, when we report cases as an exposure in the community, early on it can be, as the investigation goes on, it means that these individuals didn't get it, didn't necessarily get it from a known case or a known cluster, but they were exposed somewhere in the community. Often early in the investigation, we don't know where that is. One of the things that we are finding, however, is that as the investigation proceeds in British Columbia, at this time, in the vast majority of cases, the source of the infection is identified. And that's really important because as, as long as the majority of our cases are among people where we can actually identify the source of infection, that means that we have known trans, chains of transmission and through the the uh, public health tools that we have in um, we have available to us, such as identifying contacts and asking them to self isolate, uh, we are um, we are able to control transmission. So we do monitor that, and that number changes. And often early in the investigation, it's higher. And then as we conclude the investigation and and speak to more contacts, we we in British Columbia throughout this pandemic have been able to identify the vast majority of uh, sources of infection. Thank you. And we have time for one more question this afternoon. For any reporters that didn't get a question today, there will be a statement released shortly. For recommendations on protecting families and communities and for access to provincial guidance on COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca slash COVID-19. And the last question this afternoon comes from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. 
there. Um, school districts, including the Vancouver School District, are starting to lay out their back-to-school plans. Uh, some parents are concerned about the lack of physical distancing measures when it comes to students within the classrooms, even within their learning cohorts or groups. So if physical distancing isn't possible in a classroom, will the primary strategy be simply to rely on contact tracing if something happens rather than trying to prevent spread among those classroom groups? No, actually the plans are very much designed first and foremost to prevent cases of COVID-19. And physical distancing is a, is a gradient. It's not an absolute. We uh, often tell uh, people provide the guidance of two meters, mostly if, uh, between yourself and strangers in public. But we know that, that the other end of the gradient is to reduce really close face-to-face -face contact with individuals. And there are absolutely ways to do that in the school setting. So in other words, what, what we know is that the vast majority of transmission occurs through very close contact contact, face-to-face -face contact with somebody who's infected. So actually physical distancing is possible in the school setting. The, the, the strategies are going to be different than, than what we use in general in public, and we know that it's, it's part of a comprehensive set of interventions um, that, that reduce the risk of transmission in the school setting, such as hand hygiene, such as uh, um, making sure that kids are supported to stay at home when they are sick, that staff are supported to stay at home when they're sick and generally reducing the uh, reducing crowding in in the school setting so so that's I think is important and 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 um, and absolutely part of our our all plans. I do, however, think it's important that identifying cases of COVID-19 and uh, clusters of COVID-19 and how we would respond to that must be part of the plans as well. Schools are inseparable from the community. They're part of the community. They reflect what's happening in the community. And in the community, our plans to control COVID-19 span from prevention to response. And the same thing needs to happen in schools. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Tanya? Please, thank you. I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little more on the outbreak in Fraser Health at the Loblaws. I believe you said it was a warehouse. So did this affect staff only and did those nine presumably employees travel to any Loblaws stores as part of their job or other facilities? And an answer in French as well, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, so my understanding is that at this point, the, the individuals who are identified are staff at this warehouse. Uh, should there be changes to that, I can certainly update you on that and I won't even attempt French. <laughs> oui, il euh, y a neuf personnes qui travaillent pour l'ordre de Surrey euh, qui sont euh, uh, qui sont uh, en question uh, uh, pour un test positif de COVID-19 uh, actuellement. Uh, uh, et donc, uh, on a déclaré cette situation à cause de, du fait qu'ils travaillent ensemble dans cette, uh, dans, uh, dans cette entreprise. Donc, on va, uh, il y aura un communiqué de Fraser Health, je pense, qui, uh, qui uh, été, uh, va être présent, présenté dans les, uh, peut-être les minutes ou leur avenir et euh, qui va donner plus euh, de détails sur cette question, mais à force est de reconnaître que euh, tout ce qu'on fait, euh, chaque fois qu'on a une situation comme ceci, on fait dans cette situation. Et euh, on a travaillé, euh, comme vous le savez, à Fraser Valley Packers, où il y a actuellement, et depuis quelques, quelques maintenant plus qu'une semaine, une semaine, je pense, 77 euh, personnes qui ont euh, eu un test positif pour COVID-19. Donc, on, on va faire, euh, va faire le même travail à Loblaws. Une chose importante à ajouter, c'est que ce n'est pas une question d'avoir de, 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 peur de la nourriture en question, la nourriture à l'oblas qui est bien, mais il faut prendre les mesures qu'on prend, euh, que ce soit cette période de pandémie ou d'autres périodes, pour assurer euh, la protection de tout le monde. Donc, avec cela, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Um, until uh, Monday. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for participating.